Chapter Nineteen of North and South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma Blythe. North and South by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell. Chapter Nineteen. Angel Visits. As angels in some brighter dreams call to the soul when man doth sleep, so some strange thoughts transcend our wanton themes, and into glory peep. Henry Vaughan. Miss Sale was curiously amused and interested by the idea of the Thornton dinner party. She kept wondering about the details, with something of the simplicity of a little child who wants to have all its anticipated pleasures described beforehand. But the monotonous life led by invalids often makes them like children inasmuch as they have neither of them any sense of proportion in events and seem each to believe that the walls and curtains which shut in their world and shut out everything else must of necessity be larger than anything hidden beyond besides mrs hale had had her vanities as a girl had perhaps unduly felt their mortification when she became a poor clergyman's wife they had been smothered and kept down but they were not extinct and she liked to think of seeing margaret dressed for a party and discussed what she should wear with an unsettled anxiety that amused margaret who had been more accustomed to society in her one in harley street than her mother in five in twenty years of hellstone then you think you shall wear your white silk are you sure it will fit it's nearly a year since edith was married oh yes mamma mrs murray made it and it's sure to be right it may be a straw's breadth shorter or longer waisted according to my having grown fat or thin but i don't think i've altered in the least hadn't you better let dixon see it it may have gone yellow with lying by if you like mamma but if the worst comes to the worst i've a very nice pink gauze which aunt shaw gave me only two or three months before edith was married that can't have gone yellow no but it may have faded well then i've a green silk i feel more as if it was the embarrassment of riches i wish i knew what you ought to wear said mrs hale nervously margaret's manner changed instantly shall i go and put them on one after another mamma and then you could see which you liked best but yes that will be best so off margaret went she was very much inclined to play some pranks when she was dressed up at such an unusual hour to make a rich white silk balloon out into a cheese to retreat backwards from her mother as if she were the queen but when she found that these freaks of hers were regarded as interruptions to the serious business and as such annoyed her mother she became grave and sedate what had possessed the world her world to fidget so about her dress she could not understand but that very afternoon on naming her engagement to bessie higgins apropos of the servant that mrs thornton had promised to inquire about bessie quite roused up at the intelligence dear and are you going to dine at thornton's at marlborough mills yes bessie why are you so surprised oh, i don't know but they visit with the first folk in milton and you don't think we're quite the first folk in milton eh bessie bessie's cheeks flushed a little at her thought being thus easily read well said she you see they thinkin a deal of money here and i reckon you've not gotten much no said margaret that's very true but we are educated people and have lived amongst educated people is there anything so wonderful in our being asked out to dinner by a man who owns himself inferior to my father by coming to him to be instructed i don't mean to blame mr thornton few draper's assistants as he was once could have made themselves what he is but can you give dinners back in your small house thornton's house is three times as big well i think we could manage to give mr thornton a dinner back as you call it perhaps not in such a large room nor with so many people but i don't think we've thought about it at all in that way i never thought you'd be dining with thornton's repeated bessie why the mayor himself dines there and the members of parliament and all i think i could support the honor of meeting the mayor of milton but them ladies dress so grand said bessie with an anxious look at margaret's print gown which her milton eyes appraised at sevenpence a yard margaret's face dimpled up into a merry laugh 
Thank you, Bessie, for thinking so kindly about my looking nice among all the smart people. But I've plenty of grand gowns. A week ago, I should have said they were far too grand for anything I should ever want again. But as I'm to dine at Mr. Thornton's, and perhaps to meet the mayor, I shall put on my very best gown, you may be sure. What would you wear? asked Bessie, somewhat relieved. White silk, said Margaret, a gown I had for a cousin's wedding a year ago. That'll do, said Bessie, falling back in her chair. I should be loath to have you looked down upon. Oh, I'll be fine enough, if that will save me from being looked down upon in Milton. I wish I could see you dressed up, said Bessie. I reckon you're not what folk would call pretty. You're not red and white enough for that. But don't you know? I had dream of you long afore ever I seed you. Nonsense, Bessie. Ah, but I did. Your very face, looking with your clear, steadfast eyes out of the darkness, with your hair blown off from your brow, and going out like rays round your forehead, which was just as smooth and as straight as it is now. And you always came to give me strength, which I seemed to gather, out of your deep, comforting eyes and you were dressed in shine and raiment, just as you're going to be dressed. So, you see, it was you. Nay, Bessie, said Margaret gently, it was but a dream. But why might not I dream, a dream, in my affliction, as well as others? Did not many a one in the Bible? I see visions, too. Why, even my father thinks a deal of dreams. I tell you again, I saw you as plainly coming swiftly towards me, with your hair blown back, with the very swiftness of the motion, just like the way it grows, a little standing off like, and the white shining dress on you've gotten to wear. Let me come and see in it. I want to see you and touch it, as in very deed you were in my dream. My dear Bessie, it is quite a fancy of yours, fancy or no fancy. You've come, as I knew you would, when I saw you movement in my dream, and when you hear about me, I reckon I feel easier in my mind and comforted, just as a fire comforts one on a dreary day. You said it were on the twenty-first. Please, God, I'll come and see you. Oh, Bessie, you may come and welcome, but don't talk so. It really makes me sorry, it does indeed. Then I'll keep it to myself, if I bite my tongue out. Not but what it's true for all that. Margaret was silent. At last she said, Let us talk about it sometimes, if you think it true. But not now. Tell me, has your father turned out? Eh, hey, said Bessie heavily, in a manner very different from that she had spoken in but a minute or two before. He and many another, all hampers men, and many a one besides. The women are as bad as the men in their savageness this time. Food is high. And the men have food for their children, I reckon. Suppose Thornton sent them their dinner out. The same money spent on potatoes and meal would keep many a crying baby quiet and hush up its mother's heart for a bit. Don't speak so, said Margaret. You'll make me feel wicked and guilty and go into this dinner. No, said Bessie. Some pre-elected to sumptuous feasts and purple and fine linen. Maybe you're one on em. Others toil and moil all their lives long, and the very dogs are not pitiful in our days, as they were in the days of Lazarus. But if you ask me to cool your tongue with the tip of my finger, I'll come across the great gulf to you, just for the thought of what you've been to me here. Bessie, you're very feverish. I can tell it in the touch of your hand, as well as in what you're saying. It won't be division enough in that awful day that some of us have been beggars here, and some of us have been rich. We shall not be judged by that poor accident, but by our faithful following of Christ. Margaret got up and found some water, and soaking her pocket handkerchief in it, she laid the cool wetness on Bessie's forehead, and began to chafe the stone-cold feet. Bessie shut her eyes, and allowed herself to be soothed. At last she said, You'd have been deaved out of your five wits, as well as me if you'd have one body after another coming in to ask a father, and stand to tell me each one their tale. Some spoke of deadly hatred, and made my blood run cold with the terrible things they said of the masters. But more, being women, kept planing, planing with the tears running down their cheeks, and never wiped away nor heeded. 
of the price of meat, and how their children could not sleep at nights for the hunger. And do they think the strike will mend this? asked Margaret. They say so, replied Bessie. They do say trade has been good for long, and the masters have made no end of money, how much father doesn't know. But in course, the union does. And, as is natural, they want their share of the profits, now that food is getting dear. And the union says they'll not be doing their duty if they don't make the masters give em their share. But masters has gotten the upper hand somehow, and I'm feared they'll keep it now and ever more. It's like the great battle of Armageddon, the way they keep on grinning and fighting at each other, till even while they fight they are picked off into the pit. Just then, Nicholas Higgins came in. He caught his daughter's last words. And I'll fight on, too, and I'll get it this time. It'll not take long for to make em give in, for they've getting a pretty lot of orders all under contract, and they'll soon find out they'd better give us our five per cent than lose the profit they'll gain, let alone the fine for not fulfilling the contract. Ah, my masters, I know who'll win. Margaret fancied from his manner that he must have been drinking, not so much from what he said as from the excited way in which he spoke, and she was rather confirmed in this idea by the evident anxiety Bessie showed to hasten her departure. Bessie said to her, The twenty-first, that's Thursday week, I may come and see you dressed for Thornton's, I reckon. What time is your dinner? Before Margaret could answer, Higgins broke out. Thornton's, are they going to dine at Thornton's? Ask him to give you a bumper to the success of his orders. By the twenty-first, I reckon, He'll be potted in his brains at a get em done in time. Tell him, there's seven hundred'll come marching into Marlborough Mills a morning after he gives the five per cent, and we'll help him through his contract in no time. You'll have em all there. My master, Hamper, he's one of the old-fashioned sort. Never meets a man but an oath or a curse. I should think he were going to die if he spoke Miss Sybil, but after all, is barked worse than spot, and you may tell him one of his turnouts said so if you like. Eh, hey, but you'll have a lot of prize mill owners at Thornton's. I should like to get speech of them when they're a bit inclined to sit still after dinner, and could they run for the life on em? I'd tell em my mind. I'd speak up again the hard way they're driving on us. Goodbye, said Margaret hastily. Goodbye, Bessie. I shall look to see you on the twenty-first if you're well enough. The medicines and treatment which Dr. Donaldson had ordered from Mrs. Hale did her so much good at first that not only she herself, but Margaret began to hope that he might have been mistaken, and that she could recover permanently. As for Mr. Hale, although he had never had an idea of the serious nature of their apprehensions, he triumphed over their fears with an evident relief, which proved how much his glimpse into the nature of them had affected him. Only Dixon groped for ever into Margaret's ear. However, Margaret defied the raven and would hope. They needed this gleam of brightness indoors, for out of doors, even to their uninstructed eyes, there was a gloomy, brooding appearance of discontent. Mr. Hale had his own acquaintances among the working men and was depressed with their earnestly told tales of suffering and long endurance. They would have scorned to speak of what they had to bear to any one who might, from his position, have understood it without their words. But here was this man from a distant county who was perplexed by the workings of the system into the midst of which he was thrown, and each was eager to make him a judge and to bring witness of his own causes for irritation. Then Mr. Hale brought all his budget of grievances and laid it before Mr. Thornton, for him, with his experience as a master, to arrange them and explain their origin, which he always did on sound economical principles, showing that as trade was conducted, there must always be a waxing and waning of commercial prosperity, and that in the waning, a certain number of masters, as well as of men, must go down into ruin, and be no more seen among the ranks of the happy and prosperous. He spoke as if this consequence was so entirely logical that neither employers nor employed had any right to complain if it became their fate. The employer to turn aside from the race he could no longer run, with a bitter sense of incompetency and failure. 
wounded in the struggle, trampled down by his fellows in their haste to get rich, slided where he once was honored, humbly asking for, instead of bestowing, employment with a lordly hand. Of course, speaking so of the fate that, as a master, might be his own in the fluctuations of commerce, he was not likely to have more sympathy with that of the workmen, who were passed by in the swift, merciless improvement or alteration, who would fain lie down and quietly die out of the world that needed them not, but felt as if they could never rest in their graves, for the clinging cries of the beloved and helpless they would leave behind, who envied the power of the wild bird that can feed her young with her very heart's blood, margaret's whole soul rose up against him while he reasoned in this way as if commerce were everything and humanity nothing she could hardly thank him for the individual kindness which brought him that very evening to offer her for the delicacy which made him understand that he must offer her privately every convenience for illness that his own wealth or his mother's foresight had caused them to accumulate in their household and which, as he learned from Dr. Donaldson, Mrs. Hale might possibly require. His presence, after the way he had spoken, his bringing before her the doom, which she was vainly trying to persuade herself might yet be averted from her mother, all conspired to set Margaret's teeth on edge, as she looked at him and listened to him. What business had he to be the only person except Dr. Donaldson and Dixon, admitted to the awful secret which she held shut up in the most dark and sacred recess of her heart not daring to look at it unless she invoked heavenly strength to bear the sight that some day soon she should cry aloud for her mother and no answer would come out of the blank dumb darkness yet he knew all she saw it in his pitying eyes she heard it in his grave and tremulous voice how reconcile those eyes that voice with the hard reasoning dry merciless way in which he had laid down axioms of trade and serenely followed them out to their full consequences the discord jarred upon her inexpressibly the more because of the gathering woe of which she heard from bessie to be sure nicholas higgins the father spoke differently he had been appointed a committee man and said that he knew secrets of which the exoteric knew nothing he said this more expressly and particularly on the very day before mrs thornton's dinner-party when margaret going in to speak to bessie found him arguing the point with Boucher, the neighbor of whom she had frequently heard mention as by turns exciting higgins compassion as an unskilful workman with a large family depending upon him for support and at other times enraging his more energetic and sanguine neighbor by his want of what the latter called spirit it was very evident that higgins was in a passion when margaret entered boucher stood with both hands on the rather high mantelpiece swaying himself a little on the support which his arms thus placed gave him and looked wildly into the fire with a kind of despair that irritated higgins even while it went to his heart Bessie was rocking herself violently backwards and forwards, as was her wont. Margaret knew by this time, when she was agitated. Her sister Mary was tying on her bonnet in great clumsy bows as suited her great clumsy fingers to go to her fustian cutting, blubbering out loud the while and evidently longing to be away from a scene that distressed her. Margaret came in upon the scene. She stood for a moment at the door. Then her finger on her lips she stole to a seat on the squab near bessie nicholas saw her come in and greeted her with a gruff but not unfriendly nod mary hurried out of the house catching gladly at the open door and crying aloud when she got away from her father's presence it was only john boucher that took no notice whatever who came in and who went out it's no use higgins who could not live long in this who's just sinking away not for want of meat herself, but because who could not stand the sight of the little one's clamming? Ah, clamming! Five shillings a week may do well enough for thee, with but two mouths to fill, 
and one of em a wench who can well earn her own meat but it's clemen to us and i tell thee plain if who dies as i'm feared who will afore we've gotten the five per cent i'll fling the money back in the master's face and say be dom to you be dom to the whole cruel world of you that could nay leave me the best wife that ever bore children to a man and look thee lad i'll hate thee and the old back of the union eh and chase you through heaven with my hatred i will lad i will if you're leading me astray in this matter thou saidst nicholas on wednesday say night and it's now tuesday in the second week that a four fortnight we had the masters coming a begging to us to take back our work at our own wage and time's nearly up and there's our little jack lying abed too weak to cry but just every now and then sobbing up his heart for want of food our little jack i tell thee lad who's never looked up since he was born and who loves him as if he were her very life as he is for i reckon he'll have cost me that precious price our little jack who wakened me each morning with putting his sweet little lips to my great rough for face a seeking a smooth place to kiss and he lies clemming here's the deep sigh choke the poor man and nicholas looked up with eyes brimful of tears to margaret before he could gain courage to speak how up man thy little jack shall neck lamb i hate getting brass and will go buy the chap a sup of milk and a good four pounder this very minute what's mine thine sure enough i thought st once only don't us lose heart man continued he as he fumbled in a teapot for what money he had i lay you my heart and soul will win for all this it's but barren on one more week and you can just see the way the masters will come round praying on us to come back to the mills and the union that's to say i will take care of you enough for the children and the missus so don't it turn faint heart and go to the tyrants to seek and work the man turned round at these words turning round a face so white and gaunt and tear-furrowed and hopeless that its very calm forced margaret to weep you know well that a worse a tyrant than e'er the masters were say clam to death and see him a clam to death ere you go dare go against the union you know it well nicholas for you're one on em you may be kind hearts each separate but once banded together you've no more pity for a man than a wild hunger maddened wolf nicholas had his hand on the lock of the door he stopped and turned round on boucher close following so help me god man alive if i think not i'm doing best for thee and for all on us if i'm going wrong when i think i'm going right it's their sin who have left me where i am in my ignorance i have thought till my brains ached believe me john i have and i say again there's no help for us but having faith in the union they'll win the day see if they don't not one word had margaret or bessie spoken they had hardly uttered the sign that the eyes of each other called to the other to bring up from the depths of her heart at last bessie said i never thought to hear father call on god again but you heard him so help me god yes said margaret let me bring you what money i can spare let me bring you a little food for that poor man's children don't let them know it comes from any one but your father it will be but little bessie lay back without taking any notice of what margaret said she did not cry she only quivered up her breath my heart's drained dry her tears she said boucher's been in these days past a telling me of his fears and his troubles he's but a weak kind of chap i know but he's a man for all that and though i've been angry many a time afore now with him and his wife as knew no more nor him how to manage yet you see all folks isn't wise yet god lets them live uh, and gives them some one to love and be loved by just as good as solomon and if sorrow comes to them they love it hurts them as sore as ever it did solomon i can't make it out perhaps it's as well such a one as boucher has the union to see after him but i'd just like to see the mean as make the union and put him one by one face to face with boucher 
I reckon if they heard him, they'd tell him. If I cotched him one by one, he might go back and get what he could for his work, even if it weren't so much as they ordered. Margaret sat utterly silent. How was she ever to go away into comfort and forget that man's voice with the tone of unutterable agony, telling more by far than his words of what he had to suffer? She took out a purse. She had not much in it of what she could call her own, but what she had she put into Bessie's hand without speaking. Thank you. There's many on him gets no more, and is not so bad off. Least was does not show it as he does. But father won't let him want, now he knows. You see, Bouch has been pulled down with his childer, and her being so cranky, and they could pawn has gone this last twelve month. You're not to think we had letting him clem, for all we're a bit pressed ourselves. If neighbors doesn't see after neighbors, I don't know who will. Bessie seemed almost afraid, lest Margaret should think they had not the will, and to a certain degree, the power of help in one whom she evidently regarded as having a claim upon them. Besides, she went on, father is sure and positive the masters must give in within these next few days, that they cannot hold on much longer. But I thank you all the same. I thank you for myself as much as for voucher, for it just makes my heart warm to you more and more. Bessie seemed much quieter today, but fearfully languid and exhausted. As she finished speaking, she looked so faint and weary that Margaret became alarmed. It's now, said Bessie. It's not death yet. I had a fearful night with dreams, or somewhat like dreams, for I were wide awake and I'm all in a swounding daze today. Only your poor chap made me alive again. No, it's not death yet, but death is not far off. I cover me up, and I may be sleep, if thou cough will let me. Good night. Good afternoon. Mappin, I should say, but the light is dim and misty today. End of chapter 19 Recorded by Gemma Bloth